even more charities working in the space, we felt that there was action required to demystify the issue and identify possible solutions. Of all the research organisations we talked to, we felt that IPPR stood out as bringing together both the intellectual rigour that was required and the desire to get to the heart of the issue. And we believe that the report that has just been published demonstrates that. From a SAS perspective, the report successfully cuts through the complexity of a key aspect of the housing crisis, which is poorly understood and highlights a range of possible solutions. The report is timely. The issue has been brought sharply into focus by the health pandemic and the Everyone In initiative to find accommodation for rough sleepers and other homeless individuals and families. So first of all, I would like to say thank you to the IPR, IPPR team for their hard work, their insightful approach, and their patience in getting to the heart of the issues around what they have called transitional supported housing, or TSH. I know Marcus is going to take us through the data, or more appropriately, the lack of it, and the report findings in a moment but I want to briefly reflect on why this is a critical issue for UK society and why we feel that there is now an opportunity for charities, social investors and housing policy makers to collaborate regarding the way forward. The report highlights that at any time there are around 190,000 people in the UK whose lives have been disrupted or thrown into crisis to the extent that they require support services. They may be women or families fleeing domestic violence, individuals suffering with addiction or ill mental health. They may have just left the care system or been released from prison, or they may have arrived here as a refugee or an asylum seeker. What we know is that there are two interconnected elements that are needed to help these individuals get their lives back on track. First, they require targeted specialist support. And secondly, they need access to safe, stable and appropriate housing. Without both of these elements in place, the chances of transitioning successfully to independent living are considerably reduced. The IPPR report is important because it distinguishes this cohort, which requires transitional supported housing, from the much larger group who require long-term or permanent supported housing, such as the elderly and those with high needs disabilities. The report goes on to analyse the key issues facing the provision of transitional supported housing. These include the erosion of social housing stock, the regulatory pressures on housing associations which cause them to move away from offering transitional supported housing and the increasing presence of the unregulated private rental sector. In combination, these factors have led to increasing levels of poor quality housing for those most in need and ultimately what might be seen as a perfect storm in transitional supported housing has led to spiralling costs for Treasury. It was this situation that led us to set up social and sustainable housing. The fund is designed to provide finance to charities and other social purpose organisations who have the experience and capability to support individuals and families in crisis, but who often struggle with a lack of access to decent housing. It allows them to increase the number of properties that they own and as a result, more effectively help transform people's lives. The pandemic has shone a spotlight on the everyone in cohort as a group of vulnerable people but it has also demonstrated the significant role played by small and medium-sized charitable organisations in tackling homelessness. Social investors like SASC are ready to step up our support to expand the amount of transitional supported housing owned by these organisations. IPPR has called this, called this sector the Cinderella of our supported housing. We hope that this report will bring the issue out into the open and that with the support of policymakers, it will inform part of the solution. Hand it back to Sarah. Thank you very much, Ben. And um, just to say that, I mean, from an IPPR, uh, IPPR North perspective, we were particularly excited to have the chance to do this piece of work because um, we were um, very aware of, of how acute the um, supported housing situation is in some of the, the bigger cities um, in, in the North, as well as some of the smaller towns and cities uh, and actually in, in many rural areas too and we wanted to try and, and um, shine a light on, on some of those issues um, and kind of bring it a little bit more uh, into the open and we were particularly conscious of the fact that the government have um, had a particular interest in um, parts of, of the north because of the the debate on leveling up uh, and of course the um, the results of the general election and so we thought there was a, a moment to, to bring some of those issues together and, and to ask some further questions um, about what the, the future of, of supported housing, particularly for vulnerable groups, um, is in, in areas like um, the North. 
I'm now going to, to hand over to um, Marcus Johns, uh, who's um, uh, my friend and, and colleague at IPPR North. And Marcus is going to take you through the research, um, uh, what we did and some of the conclusions um, that, that we drew. Marcus, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am just going to share my screen and I did run through this, so I cannot now see anyone, but I hope that you can all uh, see that. Um, so uh, as Sarah said, uh, I'm Marcus Johns. Uh, I'm a research fellow at IPPR North and uh, I provided, uh, I suppose you said, the research support for, for, for this project and wrote the report along with Sarah. Um, over a course of what was around six months, maybe slightly longer, it's sort of a bit of an odd time to try and think about uh, how long it has been, but we uh, conducted a, a kind of um, extensive research programme looking at uh, a number of different data sources, including a literature review and uh, interviews with stakeholders from a range of different organisations to pull this uh, report together. And I think um, it, it comes to something that um, Ben said, I think, that, that has been really um, important for us, which is we all know that, that the UK suffers from a housing crisis, but it is dominated by a discussion around affordability, supply and demand. And, and you know, those are, are, are valid debates and they are things that as a country we need to address. But we felt that that was covering up a whole host of other issues in the housing sector. And, and one of those is the housing services that, that provide care support uh, and supervision to some of the most vulnerable people in society. And that is where we came to uh, uh, this re research and we think our conclusions for this research uh, really matter. Now, supported housing is, a, 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 I suppose, a, a fairly ill-defined term in that it scopes together a broad range of different things that have quite different aims. And so what we tried to do was approach this from, I suppose, a, a kind of outcomes-based definition. Um, so we really thought, what is it that makes um, these th this particular service what it is? Um, and, and, and essentially that is um, the, the, the support that is provided is ultimately there to enable people to journey towards uh, more independent living. Um, and that is why we have, have kind of used the word transitional uh, to talk about this particular, as, as Ben said, to distinguish this cohort of people. Um, because we think that not only is supported housing and the debate around, you know, generally care and support and supervision in housing being overlooked, but that within that, this particular cohort of people and this particular service uh, are being overlooked in, in policy too. So in, in terms of this definition uh, for transitional supported housing, um, I thought it'd be useful just to actually um, say exactly what it is that, as we've described in the report. Um, so we think that the transitional supported housing includes uh, housing where support is provided to those with particular circumstances that limit their ability to live independently and which may be responsive to support. Um, so that's really um, what we think distinguishes that from other, other bits of supported housing um, in that ultimately it is intended to be uh, time limited. However, we don't think that that should be something with a hard edge and that there have been definitions in the past that have talked about things like uh, two years support and, and we don't think that that is appropriate because ultimately it's about providing the right amount of care and support for, for the right amount of time for individuals um, who are supported. Um, we think that there should be uh, a minimum standard of care, support and supervision. Sorry, uh, that was my buzzer. A delivery would arrive whilst I'm in the middle of a presentation. Um, so yes, we think that um, uh, the tr tr transitional supported housing needs to include a minimum standard of care, support and supervision, which those people living in supported housing can expect uh, but that needs to account for, um, as, I, as I suggested, for the varying nature um, of support for their individual needs, because ultimately we are talking about a range of, of different circumstances and different vulnerabilities that will respond differently to different types of support. Um, then what we think in, in terms of the outcomes based thing is that it's very clearly got to be around sufficient support that helps people journey towards sustaining their own settled accommodation in the long term, where the vulnerabilities like some of the ones that are listed on the presentation there uh, are no longer significantly detrimental to their ability to sustain accommodation. Now we estimate uh, that there are 189,500 people at any given time living in uh, supported, uh, transitional supported housing. And if you have read the blood review, and um, I can't see uh, Imogen, but you will be able to see Imogen, who obviously uh, is, is 
uh, Imogen Bloodnet, who, who we have named the blood review for, um, that number is, is from that report. Um, and that is essentially because um, when we were defining this sector and looking at the different groups, it is largely analogous to the uh, working age uh, client group within the blood review. Um, and as I'm uh, uh, going to talk to you now, uh, we think that that is actually the, the most recent available estimate for the number of people uh, that are in this sector, um, even though that the, the, the information for that review was collected about five years ago uh, now. So here are some of the key findings um, of our report. Um, as I said, I think the first point it, it, it is really quite crucial in terms of uh, how we, have, we view the, the kind of policy response to this sector. Um, we think it's fairly poorly understood um, by policymakers, uh, but also uh, by commissioners in, in, in local government, many of whom are uh, commissioning across a range of services and, and, and no longer, uh, because of the changes to, to local authority capacity, focus on a particular area of commissioning. So we think that there is poor understanding of what constitutes supported housing. Um, and, and some of that comes to the fact that um, there is no definition of what care, support and supervision should mean in policy or law. Um, case law has said that it should be uh, more than trifling, um, which is, um, I think, unhelpful to say the least. Um, and there is also no systematic data collection of the number of people that might be accessing those services, the number of units that are available across the country. Um, but also, I think something that has uh, come out of this is that often local authorities uh, aren't able to collect that data. They don't have that level of information or um, they're, they're, they are just not collecting that uh, as a kind of collective piece across across their uh, geography. So that means that the data that a lot of these decisions, a lot of the discussion is being is being built around is, uh, as I said, uh, uh, four or five years old now. Um, we've also found a growing funding crisis in the sector. Um, a significant element of that is to do with the support side funding um, and, and, and largely relates to um, you know, 10 years of, of, of austerity or a reduction in the ability of local authorities to commission support um, to, to, to commission support services. And, and, and there have been quite drastic uh, reductions over, over the course of, uh, uh, of the past decade um, and a large number of uh, support services report um, that they are uh, you know, on the margins of viability and that many uh, face closure um, in, in the years ahead. Um, we found that the sector is, has become incredibly fragmented. And I think the point at which we would identify that fragmentation really accelerating was the end of the Supported People Programme in 2009. Um, and that was the last real time that we had um, a national strategy, but also that there was a, a shared vision and, 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 and aim for what the sector should be uh, that was driving local authority commissioning. Um, and, and, and it's become particularly fragmented. The exception to that is, um, I, I suppose, that is, is clearly the case in England. Um, it, it, it is different in the uh, nations and regions of, of the United Kingdom. Uh, so uh, Northern Ireland retains um, its own supported people programme with a clear vision and central uh, commissioning of services. And Wales uh, has recently changed what was a, a very similar programme to the housing support grant but that sets out a clear definition, aims and vision for that sector that local authorities then use to commission their services. We also found that housing associations face really significant pressure, as, as Ben uh, uh, mentioned, um, both financially and in terms of um, their, their regulatory commitments. And I think what we would term it is strategic drift, where Increasingly, there are there is evidence that the that, that housing associations cross subsidize the support the transitional supported housing that they offer in their stock uh, with their incomes from their general needs stock, and that as there has been more financial pressure on housing associations through uh, rent caps and, and, and other elements, um, that has become increasingly unattractive and difficult to justify and created a strategic drift for them away from that. Uh, uh, provision of transitional supported housing towards more of a focus on increasing the supply of, of general needs. And then we come to the fact that other providers beyond housing associations are largely overlooked um, in, in policy and in discussions around the future of funding the sector uh, 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 and how, how it should be regulated, for example. Um, and, and that comes to these uh, the charities and the voluntary organisations that are playing a a real an increasing role in providing transitional supported housing and have been doing I think uh, over the past five years or so. Um, I think the blood review estimated that at the time 
total supported housing, including that uh, for older people uh, and those with uh, uh, higher longer term needs for, for disabilities. Um, the charities represented around 7% of providers in 2016. Um, but it's much higher for working age groups. And I think our discussions have highlighted that they have been playing a growing role, um, but not perhaps are being considered in the ways that, that, that this, is, this is discussed. And that also uh, feeds into the fact that the private sector is playing an increasing role. Um, the funding pressures and the fragmentation of the sector has uh, opened the door for uh, private sector actors who I think we have found that, that you know, now I wouldn't say that this is all of them, but there is evidence that there is a level of expo exploitation of housing benefit particularly uh, taking place. Uh, there is evidence of, uh, of equity funds um, using quite complex leasing arrangements in order to be able to, to uh, I suppose, pr nominally provide supported housing, though we would question the level of care, support and supervision that is actually taking place in some of that accommodation. Um, and, and essentially that becomes a government subsidy through housing benefit. And we think that um, that, that, that needs to be significantly reduced, um, not least because uh, in, 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 in housing associations and in the charities that, that get to a certain size to become registered providers, they face a level of regulation over their stock uh, that, that cannot necessarily be said to be true for uh, the private sector and the private rental sector particularly. And finally, um, there is real rising demand uh, for uh, transitional supported housing. I mean, we, we've seen uh, significant growth in homelessness and rough sleeping uh, over the past decade. And there is a, proje a projected uh, shortfall in terms of, of uh, whether or not provision will meet need. Um, and the estimate that we found in the report, which comes from the National Housing Federation and Citra, is that by 2024-25, um, we will be short nationally 45,000 units um, of transitional supported housing. So that's for those working age client groups, as we talked about earlier. Um, and that is obviously hugely uh, uh, significant in, and, and a, a large proportion um, when you compare it to the 189,000 uh, that, that we have identified. Um, and, and so we need to uh, ensure that provision is sufficient to meet that need. But there are, I think, four key strategic challenges to how we protect existing provision and increase provision to meet that need. Um, and uh, you can see them on the presentation. Um, but the, the first one is largely um, something that has uh, come from the way that government has sought to uh, make policy, I think, over the past decade. We have seen no fewer than, than six uh, announcements of different policies that would drive quite fundamental change to the sector. Uh, from abolishing housing benefit to introducing um, the uh, social rent caps, then delaying them, sometimes backtracking on them. It has been a period that I think will be strongly characterized as, as tumultuous for the sector, um, which obviously reduces the ability to plan. Um, and without that strategic national uh, understanding of need um, and how we can meet need, um, there's no real long-term planning. There's no specific capital grant scheme uh, for uh, transitional supported housing and so the funding environment doesn't lend itself uh, to increasing provision and, and protecting provision. But the second point on this is ultimately that that, that lack of a longer term strategic vision or needs assessment is driving very short term thinking nationally um, and indeed locally. Um, many of the stakeholders that we spoke to talked around how difficult it is to respond to uh, two year commissioning cycles um, and to sustain provision over a period of time and often uh, supported people in the system need longer than the commissioning cycle uh, for the accommodation that they're living in can provide, which obviously uh, is, is detrimental to their care and support, but also really questions and, and, and causes difficulties for the viability of the sector. And, and relatedly, um, we found very limited uh, or poor oversight and regulation taking place. Um, I mean, principally in England, the main uh, concern there is that there is no systematic uh, oversight or regulation for the support services, uh, not least because there's no definition to, against which to hold providers accountable. Um, but also we find that um, housing regulation is, is really limited. There isn't a, a kind of quality, a minimum quality uh, standard for providers um, who are outside of, of being uh, registered providers because obviously registered providers need to, to meet the regulation of the regulator of social housing. Um, but we also find evidence that 
The regulator is um, largely focused on governance and financial issues, which are crucial, and they are particularly crucial in terms of the role that, that lease-based registered providers play and, and some of the questions that we would have around the suitability of that. But that there is still the need to understand and regulate what is an acceptable quality of housing for people to have uh, positive outcomes when, when they are receiving care and support. And then the final strategic challenge um, to uh, increasing and protecting provision is that there is very limited capacity for people who have completed their uh, 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 support journey or are ready to move on into more independent living to move on into uh, social and affordable housing. Um, and that does link in very strongly to the national uh, uh, crisis that, that we talk about uh, in, terms of, in terms of housing. Um, we've highlighted in the research um, uh, that around one in four quarter of units in transitional supported housing um, are currently being occupied by people who uh, have reached a stage in their care and support journey where they are ready to live more independently and move on uh, into uh, general needs accommodation. So that is a particular, uh, I, I suppose, break on the system, if you will. So in terms of our, our recommendations, we made five key recommendations for how uh, we can, I suppose, put the system uh, back together um, and, 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 and really drive that high quality support in high quality housing that I'm sure we all want to see. Now, um, the, the first one that uh, recommendation we made is around sustainable funding. Um, and, and that is a dependable revenue uh, fund funding environment on the support side um, and maintaining uh, the payment of uh, housing benefit through the welfare system. And we think that needs to be rooted in a series of uh, other recommendations, not least that new definition, which I talked about at the beginning. Um, and and I, I, I particularly drew this out because I think it's really important what the definition should be made of. We haven't recommended that government just adopt our definition. We think it should be co-produced by service providers, people with lived experience and local and national government. And that it ought to be, as it says there, people-centered, provide that minimum standard recognize the transitionary element and the particular challenges of that and be very rooted in outcomes. Um, I can see the time ticking in the corner so I will uh, just rapidly um, say you know that the recommendations that, that we have uh, highlighted and that I've listed there are very keenly focused on meeting those strategic challenges for protecting that provision um, but also for increasing um, I, I suppose for raising the voice of supported people to ensure that they have a, a level of housing quality and support quality um, that, that, that they can expect and that they can demand really because they you know they, they need that 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 quality level um, and and our recommendations together as a package are supposed to provide that long-term strategic quality approach and I will uh, leave that there uh, right I need to unshare my screens that's great. Thanks very much, Marcus. And um, I hope for those of you who um, have, have read the report um, and, uh, and, and have had a, a chance to, to think about it, that, that gives you a really good overview of, of uh, the research and, and some of our conclusions. I'm delighted this morning that we have three um, panellists to, to give their thoughts on, on the report. Um, and they're each going to speak for um, about five minutes each just to kind of give their thoughts, reactions and comments uh, on the report and some of the key questions that, that we raised um, uh, as part of, of this event. Um, we um, have uh, Josh Goodman, um, who is the Director of Social Housing at MHCLG, Imogen Blood, who is the Founder and Director of Imogen Blood and Associates, and obviously, um, as Marcus said, has played a, a key role in actually reviewing some of the evidence on this for government. And we have Lisa Hilder, who's the Treasurer of the Hull Women's Network. Um, so I'm going to um, invite Josh just to, to kick us off with, with some of your thoughts and um, comments on the report. Over to you. Thanks, Sarah. I've been asked to talk for no more than five minutes and I have more than five minutes of thoughts, so I will try and rush. Um, I mean, firstly, to say thanks very much to IPPR for this report. Um, I can understand why in the wider context of the big national debate about housing supply and affordability, this might sometimes feel like a Cinderella issue. Um, it doesn't feel like that to us in MHCLG. And indeed, I'm accompanied on this call by Cathy and Charlotte, who run our housing support team, um, which is a, a number of people who spend their time worrying about precisely these issues. Um, and we recognise 
many if not all of the issues that are raised in this report but it's really helpful to have them set out as you have and um, trying to respond to the five recommendations in turn while not blowing my five minute uh, window um starting off with funding um recognize the picture of a changing landscape over recent years in terms of where we are now though I think welfare policy is, I think, back to where the sector would want it, say if that isn't right. Um, I think in terms of capital funding, there is a large amount out there. Indeed, um, four weeks ago, we announced a new 11 and a half billion affordable homes programme with a target that 10% of that should be for supported housing. Um, and 10% of 11 and a half billion is a lot. Um, but then on the third kind of key funding stream for supported housing and transitional supported housing in particular on LA funding, completely recognise this picture of um, LA's giving less and less funding over recent years towards this sector. I'm quite interested in your views on the degree to which that is the silver bullet or whether we should be looking at towards other funding streams as well. So that's on funding. Really keen to have views on that. Um, secondly, on the definition question, yeah, it's a it's a hard one. The definition question, um, g given that as you say, this covers so many different flavours of supported housing, um, and it's really interesting the thought that we could all work together to co-produce a definition. And interested to hear thoughts on on how we do that and what role government should play in that. Um, thirdly, on taking a more strategic approach. Um, definitely recognise the value of getting more strategic local approaches on this um, and indeed on, on Tuesday we published our new national statement of expectations for supported housing which um, has guidance on best practice in planning for and delivering supported housing locally. I promise the timing of that wasn't deliberately two days ahead of this it's just luck um, but that is something we did a couple of days ago. Um, and then on the fourth recommendation about oversight and regulation, um, uh, again on Tuesday, as it happens, we announced five pilots costing three million pounds in five local areas, which are expressly designed to look at this. They're testing new approaches to enforcement and oversight of supported housing, including the quality of the support in supported housing. Um, very interested in views of what more you think we should do there and the degree to which you would like more intense regulatory oversight of of support and then finally on the challenge of moving on that's really the challenge of um wider social housing capacity i think um we are investing lots of money as i said we've just announced this new uh 11 and a half billion affordable housing program and the government is very committed to trying to increase increase numbers i think that's within my five minutes fantastic it is josh um thanks very much for that that's been a really useful um uh some, some really useful thoughts from you i'm going to to hand over now to to imogen blood um imogen over to you Hi, thanks so much for inviting me to come along. I feel slightly um, awed by the fact that the supported accommodation review has become named the blood review. I would just like to credit also Ipsos Mori and uh, my colleague Ian Copeman, who uh, did a lot of the numbers. Um, but yes, really good to come and have a chance to just share some reflections on your report, which um, I think uh, really welcome the fact that it's highlighted just how kind of hampered this sector is by the lack of um, affordable and secure accommodation to people to move on to. I think highlighting the fact that this is transitional supported uh, accommodation is really valuable because the clues in the title, this should be a route uh, onto somewhere, somewhere else for people. Um, and the, the kind of key purpose of this sector is to uh, try and support people to end their homelessness. So I think it's really crucial that you've framed it within that kind of wider um, consideration around access to affordable accommodation, because, you know, there is a real risk, as you've highlighted in the report, of people getting stuck in transitional supported housing. 
um, or people not wanting to go into it or being barred from it in the first place because um, it's, you know, the congregate nature of much of our provision still in this sector uh, doesn't work for a lot of people with complex needs. So I think those are really important starting points. Um, I guess also just to recognise, um, wrote a report earlier this year for Riverside Housing Group with uh, Nicholas Police at University of York, which um, coined the idea, I think we stole it from Kate Farrell at Crisis, who's also in the audience, so not wishing again to nick anyone else's idea, of a traumatised system. Um, and we found a lot of evidence of this traumatised system going on at every level within transitional supported housing. Um, you know, lots of examples of efficiencies leading to inefficiencies. So I know you referred earlier to kind of you know, pressing repeat on the commissioning cycle because you're not quite sure how to kind of achieve the vision that you want to as a local authority commissioner. Um, you know, we've seen in a lot of areas this kind of tightening of a of a pathway through supported accommodation. You know, if we can just have people in here for nine months and then on to here for two years. And actually, if you haven't got something at the end of that, you know, people just get kind of pushed out of that system. Um, and, and supported housing isn't uh, able under those conditions to deliver the potential, which I think it clearly has. Um, but it feels to me as though there's a real urgency to kind of clarify the purpose of supported accommodation and to really understand what we're trying to achieve by different types of supported accommodation. Um, you know, to be really clear uh, whether actually what we want is people to be living in a a, a, a congregate property together so that they can benefit from uh, the therapeutic presence of others, whether that's to increase their safety from perpetrators of domestic violence, whether that's to, um, you know, because people actively want to live collectively, or whether actually we're simply containing people whilst we wait for move on accommodation to become available. And I think in a lot of our work with local authorities, really getting that question around just what is the function of this project and how do we make sure that the bits of, of, of housing and support kind of match up to support that. I think this is, as your report highlights and brings home again, such a difficult and complex area. I mean, we obviously spent years immersed in trying to understand exempt supported accommodation and trying to support other people to understand it. It's incredibly kind of complex, all the regulation around it. And as we've seen through that kind of, you know, uncertainty of policy making, it's, you know, hugely political. Uh, you know, nobody wants to kind of, you know, have this honest and, and difficult conversation that may indeed unsettle the provision we're all desperately trying to hang on to. Um, and, and, you know, it, it does raise some really uh, key questions. I particularly like the focus in your report on this idea of being people centred um, and have spent a bit of time thinking around what that might mean. I think when we look in local areas at what is and isn't happening is that, you know, commissioners, as I've mentioned, and, and providers doing everything they can to sort of hang on to the provision they've got in the face of uh, enormous cuts. Um, and what I think is missing from that is this sort of sense of both casework around the individual and really kind of making sure that we're seeing that individual right through the housing options process, which is often very, very dislocated from uh, the commissioning and provision of supported uh, housing, right through into, um, you know, a, a, a trying to access uh, permanent accommodation, whether that's ideally through uh, an allocation within the social housing system or whether it's access into the private rented sector. And we sort of lack that kind of, you know, casework around individuals and those di three very different parts of um, the sector seem, seem to not be sufficiently integrated both at a local and a national level. So we've got kind of good work going on in the Homelessness Reduction Act by prevention teams, but it's not joining up. Uh, and people, you know, we find in a lot of areas, people are getting referred into supported housing without going anywhere near housing options. Um, so there's no kind of through flow. And, and then we find people in, house, in, in supported housing aren't necessarily uh, being supported to get onto the housing register and facing a lot of barriers when they do. So it feels like somehow bringing together those kind of three elements um, as a starting point, both within our local integrated strategies and also nationally feels like a really kind of key part of this. I absolutely agree we need more investment in this sector, but I think we need to be really careful about quite how and where we invest it, really clear about whether 
we do indeed need capital investment in a lot more congregate supported housing. We certainly need capital investment in more affordable uh, housing, and we certainly need excellent revenue funding for specialist support that can follow the individual uh, through the best form of housing for them, given what their needs and circumstances are at that time. But I think we just need to be careful that we don't simply put a lot more capital funding into building a lot more transitional supported housing whilst some of those systemic issues remain um, you know, unresolved. So those are my initial uh, thoughts. Oh, as Josh said, could probably go on for about five hours, but that's five minutes worth just to kick us off. Thank you. Thanks, Imogen. Uh, and again, some, some really useful thoughts there. Um, uh, I'm now going to move swiftly on to, to Lisa Hilder um, to, to give us her thoughts. Lisa, over thank, to you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, really interesting um, perspectives thus far on transitional supported housing. Hull Women's Network is based in Hull, as you might have guessed, and we offer supported housing to women and children fleeing domestic violence and abuse. And it very much is that transitional housing that is required and is what we offer. Um, we also um, pay a lot of attention to permanent resettlement and ways in which uh, women can rebuild their lives on a permanent basis. But some of the, the thoughts that strike me, having read the report, are that um, the transitional nature of what we do and what many providers do is a crucial bridge from crisis through to recovery. And sometimes I think, um, perspectives from the public or people outside the sector are that bricks and mortar are the answer. Well, bricks and mortar are essential, but that uh, supported intervention is absolutely critical to enabling, in our case, women to move from destitution, disorientation, uh, traumatization, through to resettlement and recovery. So that bridge that transitional supported housing provides um, cannot be avoided. And for me, uh, it's one of the things that prevents women bouncing in and out of abusive relationships and unsuitable housing. So getting on a supported, stable pathway from A to B is something that helps to change lives. Uh, and that's what we do. Um, and it's evidenced, um, and this is one of the other things that strikes me, it's evidenced by the fact that on average, women will leave and return to a violent relationship seven times. When we house them and we provide that supported housing, they make the permanent break from the perpetrator first time round. So that is critical, both in terms of quality of life for those women and kids, but also ripples out through the commissioning and provision um, environment, because what we want people to do is to live safe, positive uh, lives that contribute to society and the transitional supported housing around uh, women fleeing violence and abuse has a really key part to play in that. And so that brings me on to how that resonates in the report around outcomes focus. We need to establish what's the point of this? Why are we all doing it? You know, what are we trying to achieve? And clearly, in the context of abusive relationships, it's enabling women and kids to live free from violence and abuse. But there will be other outcomes that apply to different types of transitional supported housing. And I think as commissioners and as providers, we need to be really clear on what those outcomes are in order to have a fighting chance to achieve them. I think some of the challenges in the current environment, sometimes it's about money. Um, 
and whether that's capital or revenue, the, the challenges are well documented. But I also think it's about commissioners and providers being able to be bold, not being afraid to be bold, and to say, we want to achieve outcomes, better quality of life for people in supported housing. And that's what we're focused on. And again, what resonated for me in the report was the um, concept around people-centered uh, work. And many colleagues who've been around in the sector for a long time will say, well, this isn't a new idea. It's not a new idea, but it's something that I think we need to constantly remind ourselves of. Um, I think the pandemic has provided us with a range of challenges, but also a range of opportunities because it forces us to think in different ways. And um, we've seen two specific spikes in demand as a result of the pandemic. First, when lockdown occurred, and secondly, when the restrictions started to be lifted. And what we saw was the absolute need for um, immediate crisis intervention, safe space uh, for women to flee to. And then the ongoing challenge that arises from that is, well, what happens next? Having um, done our best to meet that surge in demand and increase our capacity to uh, rise to that, how do we manage the ongoing recovery process for that cohort and ensure that our capacity grows um, and is sustained and maintained to enable that to happen to the end of those recovery processes. So I would echo the thoughts that this report is very well timed. It highlights an issue that I think has perhaps been overlooked more broadly uh, in the past, but absolutely reiterates the bridge that transitional supported housing has to offer and can offer to a whole range of very vulnerable client groups uh, to enable them to move on successfully, recover and live positive lives. So I'll pause there for a moment, um, probably used up my five minutes, um, but happy to answer any questions at the right time. Thanks very, thanks very much, Lisa, and um, thank you to, to all three of our speakers. Um, I think lots of interesting food for thought there, and also that there's a, a lot of consensus around the kind of people-centred um, focus that, that we had in the report. So now what I'd like to do is to, to open it up to some wider discussion um, to get some of your thoughts and views and comments um, on the report and, and what you've heard so far. And, and there is quite a few com comments coming through on, on the chat. Um, questions there from Maria about the provision of um, social housing units, uh, which is also something that, that came up in our report. Um, uh, we, we didn't go into too much detail on it because we were conscious that that could be a whole other report, um, but, it, but it is something that, that we, were, we, were, we were aware of in terms of that, that wider um, debate. Um, there's a, also um, a question there, I don't know, Deborah Stevenson, I don't know if you want to, to um, ask that directly. Um, Deborah has just put a question here about um, the affordable housing programme, which is open to RSLs, but what about um, charity and voluntary sector? Um, Deborah, I don't know whether you want to say any more about that. Yeah, I mean, I work for Rethink um, Mental Health. So we, we house people with severe and, and enduring mental health. And what we're finding is that we're looking to develop new projects, but actually we can't get the capital funding or any grant aid um, on any of the programmes or the cash um, you know, the care and support housing grant, it, 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 ultimately the owner has to be an RSL. 
So the voluntary sector is ruled out of any of that. And actually, we're, we're a national charity. We, we, you know, we have all the governance in place. Yeah. Larger charities should be able to, if not even the small charities, should be able to access some of this government funding. Okay, right. Um, great point. Thanks for that. I'm just going to take a couple of other um, questions and points before um, I invite um, Imogen and Josh and, and Lisa to, to respond. So we also had a, um, a, a comment here, um, which I think is a question from Mark, uh, who's interested in the use of enforcement. Mark, do you want to to say, uh, is there a, a kind of question behind that that you want to, to pose? Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the concerns I have about um, some of the stuff I've seen in the guidance um, that was mentioned about enforcement and raising standards is that I'm worried that we're going to be stifled. Uh, I, I welcome the, the drive up of quality of accommodation and stuff, but um, we can see from the Housing Association um, sector, which is over-regulated because it's stifling um, innovation and al almost um, killed any development of social housing because everyone's obsessed with retaining V1 and G1 rating and all that kind of stuff that we don't want this to wash over into a sector that is using innovation to try and resolve some of the problems. I think the approach more, ought to be more around developing new innovative pro approaches rather than focusing on um, over-regulation really. Um, that, that, that's my worry is that if there's a focus on enforcement and regulation it drives out actually some good players um, in, in the space because government get obsessed with regulation and one thing we know that um, great big businesses are, are good at doing is dealing with regulatory uh, requirements but not particularly brilliant at dealing with the needs of local people. Okay that, that's an interesting point Mark and um, thanks for that. Um, I also just want to um, to bring uh, Toby Lloyd in here, um, and, and Toby actually uh, um, helped us in, in the development of this report. Um, so Toby, I, I wondered if you want to just say anything about the, the point that you're making there about, about the sort of um, potential for social housing to dominate the debate. I suppose, yes, um, and the point I was making in the chat was that um, while I completely agree about the, the, the overall need for, for increased social housing, um, I'm also aware that the, the, that need is so great from so many different sources that when we're talking about something as specific as supported housing and the need for move on accommodation, I, I don't think we're ever going to solve that problem, at least not in the foreseeable future. We're not going to solve that problem with general needs uh, social housing provision, much though that is needed. Therefore, I think, in the, at least for the foreseeable future, we do need to be looking at specific solutions for housing this particular group. Um, and given that given that there is so much demand for overall government subsidies, should we be looking for alternative sources of, of funding, of capital structuring, given, um, the, as Mark set out, the, the complexities of the different ways in which revenue and capital are provided here? Brilliant. That, that's great. Thanks for that. Uh, I, I finally, I just want to bring in um, Ray Cordell. Um, I can't, can't see you, Ray. Um, but Ray is just... Uh, um, are you there, Ray? Hi, yes, it's Cordell. Yeah. Um, I, Ray, you just asked a point there about the, um, you know, you're kind of, uh, com, you know, perplexed as to why we silo people in this process. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? And then I'm going to um, to, to, to pass the conversation back to um, our panellists to, to give their thoughts on, on what's been asked. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a, it's a general point, really, about how we tend to reflect the people that we are all concerned about. Um, and, and what we do is we silo uh, all of these different groups into homelessness or domestic violence, care leavers, mental health, drug and alcohol, etc., uh, which really isn't reflective of society um, as a whole. Uh, we should treat people as people. Um, I, I'm not advocating that there, there aren't circumstances where there should be very specialist provision for, um, you know, at certain uh, individuals, but I think generally speaking, we, you know, we could look at in, in terms of new innovative approaches. We could look at uh, the way that we provide support and accommodation for people. Um, I've, I've, I've worked in a really innovative uh, scheme in um, South Gloucestershire where we had single homeless young people, childless couples, parents. Uh, all cohabitating you know, brilliantly together and that's the experience that they will have when they go beyond into move on when they move into society they will live in a community and I think there's, there's, yeah. there's just a danger that we 
through everything that we we, we do and say we, we tend to silo people okay. yeah no i know thank you for that i mean i think it's a, it's a really important point especially for, for those of us who work in 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 the land of, of policy um so um but so thanks for that I, i'm going to pass back to um a lot of really interesting questions there and i am going to i'm going to um, quickly come to the panelists and then we'll go back out for, for another round of, of uh, questions and discussion. So do feel free to keep putting your, your comments in the box and I'll try to get to as many people as possible. Um, but um, perhaps come to Lisa first. Um, you know, any, any thoughts or um, any particular aspects of those questions that, that you'd like to pick up on? Sorry, Lisa, you're on mute there. Sorry. Yeah. So we had one question about availability of capital and availability of the affordable homes program um, and the fact that it's directed at RSLs. Um, I think it's a really interesting question about um, how that capital could be made uh, appropriately available to um, organisations with social purpose. Um, there is one obvious solution to that, isn't, and that is um, supporting organisations to become RSLs um, and we're engaged in a piece of work at the moment um, which is peer-led in the women's sector that is looking at precisely that. So I think there are some routes to the affordable homes programme that are medium term but um, as I say it's an interesting thought as to how it could be made more widely available in an appropriate way. I think the other um, thought I would have about that is that the AHP isn't the only route to capital. And clearly the work that we've done with SASC demonstrates that we've been able to access um, uh, at the moment, five million pounds worth of capital that has enabled us to grow our housing provision. So, um, it's worth thinking about the broader sources of capital that are available and social investment is one. Um, the other point I'd like to pick up on is around regulation. And um, I think none of us would argue that we would want quality to be paramount in this type of housing provision. Um, and I think the trick is, how do we, first of all, define quality and secondly, put in place mechanisms that allow quality to flourish rather than having a tick box um, template based approach that um, perhaps uh, identifies indicators that don't quite hit the mark. So, um, I would welcome the quality standards that are proposed in, in the report, um, but with the slight health warning of, let's think that through in terms of what does it actually mean for people? What is quality uh, social housing for the people who are living in it? Um, and what do they think they want um, as well as something that is desired by providers and commissioners. So I shall pause there and let the other panelists talk. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, Josh, have you got thoughts in particular on that question about access to the, to the Affordable Homes Grant? Yeah, um, thanks, that's a really rich and useful set of comments. Um, I think firstly on um, charities, and voluntary organisations having access to affordable homes grants. Um, I think it's worth saying like that there is a reason why the regulated sector is regulated. And it is a combination of making sure that when we put in billions of pounds of taxpayers' money, that it is then in order to buy effectively a service that is then provided in perpetuity by housing associations and local authorities and other bodies, um, we want to make sure that a good service is provided on an ongoing basis in order to protect the users of it. Um, so th th there is a reason why the social housing sector is regulated. But I think the question Lisa raises about what are the obstacles to regulation 
uh, sorry, what are the obstacles to registering, especially for smaller organizations, is, is a really interesting question. Um, secondly, I wanted to I observe this debate around um, enforcing and regulating the quality of support. And I think there's a really interesting dynamic in this conversation between on the one hand, Marcus and IPPR saying there should be more regulation and oversight. And on the other hand, other people like Mark saying, well, we don't want to, we want to make sure that doesn't go too far and stifle innovation. Um, and Lisa saying, let's make sure it's a, it's a user centered view of quality, not just a provider driven view of quality. It's, it is a really interesting challenge. You know, how do you, how do you make sure you are tackling the worst practice while not stifling innovation? Uh, and imposing a one size fits all solution. That is part of what our the three million pounds of pilots that we've just announced are looking at, but there's definitely a journey to go on with that. Um, I think I'll stop there, So. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, I think you've, you've summarized that dynamic really well, actually, in terms of the, I guess that's the conundrum at the heart of, of uh, a lot of this, a lot of this debate. Um, Imogen, um, any reflections on, on what you've heard so far? Yeah, I mean, just just to say, um, uh, just to pick up on that point around um, how we monitor quality. Um, I, I absolutely agree. There's a real tension there because I think a lot of the you know, the kind of quality monitoring that we need to do has to happen at a local level to be meaningful, really. Um, I mean, I absolutely agree with Lisa that we need kind of quality indicators that actually ask people living in supported housing, whether they feel valued, whether they feel as though they, um, you know, have, have been supported to progress uh, in their lives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we also need that kind of whole system monitoring at a local level. So, you know, actually, if one of the outcomes of um, successful transitional supported housing placement is uh, to be supported to move on you know that's not something which we can entirely hold the providers of supported accommodation projects accountable they obviously have a role to play but as we've heard today there's so much more going on in that so there is a real challenge because a lot of that does have to happen locally um, and really probably does need to be coordinated at a local level by you know in the past we'd have had a supporting people partnership wouldn't we uh, you know or whether it's a homelessness reduction board whether it's a local authority uh, you know there needs to be that kind of local uh, commission kind of uh, quality inspection going on and of course those are areas that have become uh, you know extremely hard hit in the last decade um, with through a range of cuts. I also just wanted to pick up on um, I think it was Toby's point um, around sort of you know do we need to invest more um, capital in sort of developing a, a whole new strain almost of, of move on accommodation and I think that's a really um, interesting idea and, and, I, and I, I, in, in many ways of course yes I think we absolutely need to throw everything we can at this we need to come at this challenge from a number of of angles um, but I think there are you know I, I suppose what we need to make sure is that, that move on accommodation that we create for people does actually offer them proper secure tenancies um, and doesn't sort of simply then require that they move on in another two years otherwise we simply move the problem along and we don't give people the kind of stability of tenure that we know they need to get their lives back we obviously need to also make sure that those tenancies don't involve um, you know significantly inflated rate uh, rents using um, intensive housing management so people are blocked from kind of getting back to work and we need to make sure that uh, you know in accordance with the housing first principles that actually that housing and support can be separated so that you know if somebody doesn't want to engage with the support or the support is no longer needed they don't have to move on um, and we also need to think about how we kind of get people into that system then because what we you know we want to make sure that we don't simply create something at the end of another staircase model so people have to go through a whole period of uh, congregate housing in order to then act Access that kind of move on accommodation uh, and we don't want people who don't need support ending up coming into that system because that's the only way to get access to an affordable tenancy so there's a lot going on there to kind of level but but I absolutely agree it's an important area to look at but it has to happen alongside um, both development of, of, of social housing and really crucially looking at our allocations policies to social housing uh, because this group of people face enormous barriers in relation to rent arrears in relation to past antisocial behavior or the antisocial behavior of their violent partners and actually you know looking at all of these things across the piece is really important otherwise we create a load of kind of perverse uh, incentives across that whole system I believe. Great I mean and I think that probably speaks to, to Cordell's point as well that you know we have to look at this as through the eyes of the individual and and um, that will will cross you know potentially many different aspects of um, of the policy uh, the policy debate um, and, and try to tailor solutions on, on that kind of person basis. 
Um, I'm just going to, to just bring in um, some other people who are, who are um, uh, putting uh, comments on, on the chat box and, and also questions. So um, Suzanne Young, um, you had a question there just about um, the, the flexibility uh, in terms of housing benefits. Suzanne, I don't know if you want to come in and just ask that. Hi, um, my phone is ringing at the same time, so I hope you can't hear that while I'm talking. <laughs> um, okay, great. Yeah, um, thanks for all the presentations. They've been really engaging and all of the thoughts and comments. Um, my question was about, um, so in short-term supported accommodation, um, so rent is usually covered by housing benefit, but it can be uncapped. Um, housing benefit and so that means that it is an extremely high rent um, and the issue for people who live there if they are attempting to move on and if there is somewhere for them to move on to and that's another debate that um, this group has been having um, if they get a job for example then that rent becomes unaffordable for them so this means that it's it's a disincentive to, to finding work, or in fact, it means that they just they can't move on. Um, and there would need to be a degree of flexibility with the rent to, to be able to make it workable for people. And I wonder if there are any thoughts on how to implement that flexibility. Okay, that, 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 that's useful. Um, just looking at the other comments, um, there's a point here from Andy Mosley, who, uh, who asked a question about Scotland, and I think Marcus's um, because Marcus had mentioned the fact that um, the devolved nations and regions have their own approach to this. Um, so I think Marcus has done a bit more about an explanation about that, Andy. But if you have further questions, do follow up with us um, after, after this. Um, we've got a question there from, um, uh, I'm not sure it's a question, maybe more of a comment from, from Caroline um, Pille. Caroline, do you want to say any more about that? Uh, yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, yes, thanks for the really interesting um, presentation so far. The point I was making actually wasn't uh, totally unrelated to a uh, point Ray made about, um, you know, housing and services for uh, yeah. people and not not putting people into silos. And I, I, can, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I think actually, if we start from that basis, linking to the point that I've made in my in the chat is, you know, I, I work lots with local authorities at the moment i'm engaged in planning quite a major estate regeneration program for one of the local authorities uh, and the first um, activity that we're undertaking is making sure that the housing needs assessment is bang on so that we know what we are what we are uh, reproviding for now these people that we are doing the housing as uh, needs assessments with they are as ray says people so, you know, there will be people with support needs in there. There'll be people with physical needs in, in, in these homes. There'll be people with mental health needs in these homes. Why is it that actually we're not able to produce a housing needs assessment that informs housing uh, delivery strategies that actually meets the needs of everyone that's been identified as part of that housing needs assessment? Why do we then need to start to silo um, people? now? I understand and appreciate, of course, that there will be, uh, you know, uh, conditions where we have to look at, okay, we, we've got to pay slightly uh, different attention or special attention, if you like, to a particular person or, pe or, or, or small group of people. But in, in the main, let's, let's just start by saying, actually, where are people living right now? Yeah. You know, where are we finding the people right now that we're, we're, we're actually talking about, that these reports relate to? Um, and I think there's, for me, that, you know, what there's, there, there appears to be a slight disconnect between, let's say, the housing delivery teams, the people responsible for identifying housing need and going out there and, de and developing it, slight disconnect between them and perhaps the social care team, who often get lumbered with this issue, this challenge, this problem. Um, and I think that bringing the two together um, uh, will probably I think it, it help us start looking start to look at the solutions even with regards to funding and and I, I take the point also that was made earlier on about the affordable homes program and you know perhaps that being um, opened up and, and, and more accessible to a wider group of organizations um, and I, I you know I would support um, support that as well yeah. um, I, I have made a further comment in there about the uh, one housing mm -hmm. estate 
you know, and, and how, how are we accessing the funds that are available there as well, actually, because that, you know, the one housing estate is, is, is more than just local authority land, it's NHS land as well. Um, so that it was more a point really, as opposed to a question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really, it's a really interesting one. Um, as someone who's got, you know, I, I've always been really interested in, in the planning system, and um, and it does feel like sort of slightly disconnected from 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 this debate. So um, I think it's a it's a really important um, point to make. Um, just looking through some other, um, before I come back to our panelists, just some other, um, just looking. There's a specific question there from Mona, um, which I think we've we've um, we've touched on a little bit. Um, I don't know if you want to say any more about it, Mona, but you're just asking about some um, sources of other funding, which I think um, Toby had also mentioned, uh, you know, the possibility of, of other capital, such as pension and institutional investors. But Mona, I don't know whether you want to, to add anything to that. Uh, yes, apologies if that's a slightly strange question. I don't usually cover the sector, but um, so I'll, uh, I'm a journalist, so I read this, our pension funds. and. I'm interested in if they couldn't play a role in, in, I mean, some of them are invested in social housing, but it's been mentioned before that private capital has not always played the most helpful role in uh, providing social housing. So how could it be made sure that they're not actually making the problem worse because obviously they're interested in maximizing their profits in some ways. So there's a bit of a contradiction there, but potentially, for example, local authority pension schemes, uh, it would, come quite organically for them to also like in, invest in social housing and, and, and supported housing. So I'm interested in that. Yeah, okay, great. Thanks, Mona. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna see if there's any other questions. Yeah, so I, I'm just gonna take that final question from Laura Furness, um, who asks, what actions can people in this virtual room take to move the conversation forward, which um, actually would have been a good one for the end. Um, but um, uh, I'm, I'm going to pass that back to our panelists um, just to, to give their thoughts. Lots of lots of really um, interesting points there. Um, uh, uh, who would who would like um, Imogen? Well, shall I come to you first? <laughs> so, um, I, I mean, I realise there's a lot of a lot of questions in there, but if maybe if you want to pick out one of the the, the two or three that you're particularly interested in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just quickly, I suppose, to say to Mona that, um, you know, there's some, been some really interesting work going on um, with Residence, which is a, a, and a, and a number of other social investors, of course, but, you know, Residence has had a quite a long standing partnership with St Mungo's and there's been some really interesting work going on there to use um, social investment, um, or, you know, private investment, but in, through, through, through social means uh, into acquiring properties, which are then rented out uh, to people on local housing allowance rates, um, ideally with some wraparound support. So I think that's a really kind of promising model and something which, um, you know, can, can, can be really positively developed. Um, I guess I should try and say something about this hugely knotty question of exempt accommodation and intensive housing management. Uh, it always makes me feel slightly kind of weak at the knees. It's such a complex area. Um, but I guess, you know, just to kind of give a fair, you know, for those who aren't, you know, deeply um, in you know, <laughs> up to their eyeballs in this whole regime, I guess just a kind of overview really is to say that as there have been huge you know, cuts to support funding um, post supporting people, um, inevitably almost the sector has lent uh, much more heavily into um, intensive housing management um, and, and and the whole sort of um, you know trying to get your property exempted uh, so it can remain within the housing benefit funding regime has of course become an industry in its own right. Um, and, uh, you know, however, there is also, you know, a huge amount of legitimate use of um, that um, funding stream. Um, it's very much the kind of mainstay of loads of um, projects. I know I was speaking to somebody, for example, from the veterans sector recently, who was saying that pretty much all kind of veteran supported housing is almost entirely funded through that with very little support funding coming through other means. So obviously, you know, it's an oversimplification to suggest that, you know, it's entirely been a question of lots of unregulated private people jumping into the sector and um, abusing it. Um, however, you know, that the issues which, sorry, I've just forgotten your name, somebody raised there around people getting trapped in accommodation with too high uh, rents, I think it was Susanna, is, it, it is, a really, is a really important one. Um, and I think, you know, it feels to me as though the regulation that we're talking about does need to be focused um, on, you know, how, how you know, the, the levels of exempt housing benefit that are being charged. I know your report features 
uh, some good practice uh, going on in Hull at the moment, where I know they've tried at a local level to bring together both the housing benefit team and um, kind of local, uh, I think sort of PRS kind of enforcement teams are involved in that, as well as, of course, commissioners of, of housing support, adult social care. And they've been trying to sort of go around and, and, and kind of visit everywhere that's, that's charging exempt uh, accommodation to really look both at the standard of the, the housing and, uh, you know, whether the level of support is adequate. And that feels like a really promising model. I think at, at a sort of national level, there aren't really enough teeth for any of those um, kind of players to sort of actually kind of enforce whatever they find. Um, and, you know, there are, you know, that does also require quite a lot of proactive you know capacity joined up thinking actually kind of physically going out and visiting places at a local level which a lot of authorities just haven't got the resource to do I think or it's perhaps not been prioritized so it feels as though there does need to be that kind of really you know focused regulation because you know there are undoubtedly projects which are making the most of this loophole absolutely no question of that we were we were kind of half asked and kind of half not asked to highlight that in the original supported accommodation review I know at the time Lord Freud was very very kind of vexed about the idea that there were private providers that were kind of maxing out on intensive housing management but we there was no way within our report we could even start to kind of get to the bottom of what that the extent of that looked like but it certainly feels as though there are some some, some regulatory loopholes that could be tightened there and that you know moving forwards actually you know if you are an individual living in an individual property receiving support there's no reason why we can't if we decide to keep the exempt support accommodation um, exempt housing benefit regime there's no reason why we can't look at that on a case-by-case -case basis uh, it's an individual that makes the claim if they need the support at that time no reason why we can't make that claim and if they transition into work we can we can change that claim so you know I think there can be flexible use of it but we do need to to get on top of that from a regulatory point of view. Okay great thanks Imogen. Um, Josh just want to come to you briefly have you got any um, thoughts on, on the questions in particular that one about the the link across to housing um, housing needs assessment that yeah. Caroline asking about. Yeah, yeah. So, so on, on housing needs assessment, um, this is precisely what the five pilots that we launched this week, one of the things they are looking at is, so we're, we're funding five areas to do a number of things. Some, some of them are around the issue we've just been discussing on um, oversight of quality, including the use of intensive housing management. But some of it is also about strategic planning and trying to do a kind of granular housing needs assessment that gives yeah. give, gives them the right picture to plan with. I mean, I just observed that across all of these issues, one of the issues for central government is about how to give sufficient support and guidance to local authorities without controlling local authorities too much. And there, there is a localism question that runs throughout all of this. Yeah, I, I was wondering that as well, actually, um, that uh, I mean, that's something that's very kind of close to our heart at IPPR North and, um, you know, you know, the potential of devolution too, to be able to have that kind of flexibility to, to move on some of these things. Um, and we we explored that tension in the report to Marcus and I, you know, because um, obviously you, all, you sort of you need sort of national um, standards and and, um, uh, and guidelines, but then the, the extent to which you can provide that kind of local flexibility is, is, is really important too, because every context will be different with, with its own set of um, economic and social challenges. Um, Lisa, um, just come to you finally. Have you got thoughts on um, on any of the points raised? Just in terms of people getting stuck um, in enhanced rent tenancies, um, I think Imogen, you you put the point very well in um, and stole the point I was going to make really, but I'll elaborate on it um, in terms of the fact that tenants are individuals, they make individual uh, housing benefit claims. And if they are at a point in their recovery where they require less support and less intensive housing management, then we can move them on to a general needs local housing allowance claim which then makes the tenancy wholly affordable for them. So I think it's very much um, continuing this theme of people-centered housing provision and responding to the needs of individuals, which kind of links across really to the comments that have been made around siloing client groups. And of course, people are individuals, they, uh, if they're vulnerable, they may have a number of different vulnerabilities. 
And again, I think it's about wrapping support around the individual and not um, putting them in boxes. Now, sometimes that's much easier said than done and specialist skills and expertise need to be brought in to deal with particular issues. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the individual has to be shunted from service to service in order to uh, attempt to get those needs met. So I think it's very much about flexibility in that transitional supported housing to have some core provision, but then draft in additional specialist support as and when that's required according to, to client need. Yeah, great, great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and and um, I just want to, um, it looks like the, um, we haven't got any um, specific questions in, in the chat box at the moment, but I would like to invite uh, Marcus and um, Ben, if um, if you would like to to comment on, on any of the questions raised, um, Marcus, should we, should we come to you first? Thank you, Sarah, and, and thank you everyone for your, your comments and questions. They've been really, really interesting and very insightful. And I I, I think there's a few things that um, I'd, I'd come back to. I mean, the first is the the way that uh, you know I see the five recommendation that we, just that we we put in the report is not necessarily five separate recommendations that should be implemented. Uh, but a package that, that link together. And I think it comes back to something that, that Josh mentioned earlier, actually, around, um, you know, the reason that, that um, the regulated uh, uh, sector is, is regulated and can access that, 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 that funding, um, and that we kind of saw that as, as a kind of a bit of a, a give and take in, in terms of, you know, if the sector uh, can have a, a higher levels of regulation, then I think it needs to be coupled with a, a fairer and a more sustainable funding environment. And I think both of those are necessary. Um, and then, and, and, and I guess, yeah, it, it, it's kind of how I see it all coming back to this definition uh, problem. Um, because one of the things that really struck me when I was um, um, at kind of broaching as a, a, what Imogen was, you know, walking out about housing uh, benefit and exempt models and, and all of those things is that they are very rooted in ownership and they are very um, unclear on, on who it is that is supposed to be actually supported and, and what care and support that they should provide. And I think what we want to get to in terms of the, the recommendations, the definition is, is to switch that around, that the, the most important thing is obviously the, the, the people at the heart of it and the outcomes. And, and, and I think when you start conceptualizing the system um, in terms of, and, and I, again, I think you have to bake in the, the, the point that Imogen made that it's not a tick box outcome exercise. It is that these are people with complex needs and, and, and multiple vulnerabilities and that they have their personal outcomes and, and, and a personal journey that a support service can help them out understand what that outcome should be. And I think it's about recognizing the system needs flexibility, but that for almost all people in the system, there will be a minimum standard. And I think it's important to give a minimum standard not just in terms of so it can be ticked off by local authorities, but for those people to have a something against which to assess their situation and to raise their voice and to you know be able to question what support they're receiving um, if they think that it, it it's it's not enough or un unhelpful. Um, and I think the the by putting the definitions of ownership first, it opens those loopholes that um, I think we, we've talked about a bit and where that perhaps unhelpful private sector um, role has, has become apparent is essentially using those loopholes to create complex financial arrangements that allow you to access housing benefit where, you know, it was almost the, 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 the exempt uh, policies were almost written to try and stop that instead of a kind of positive vision of the sector that says, here's what we're trying to provide. Um, and I suppose what, what my response to that would essentially be that you know, I don't think anyone would turn down additional capital funding as long as it is like flowing into the system in, in a healthy way, in a way that is promoting those positive outcomes, whether that's through social investors or through, uh, you know, a, a, a government backed um, scheme. And I, I think that would be the way that we'd see a healthier role, perhaps, uh, for, for the private sector. And, and as, um, you know, Imogen has, has touched on and as obviously we've worked with SASC, there are um, those those really positive models that, that we can uh, we can build on and we've highlighted those in the report. Um, in terms of local support, I think it's absolutely right that we need you know a, a local role. Um, in the recommendation that we made about support 
regulation. We talked about the role that local authorities should play, but we fell short of saying local authorities should be the people who do this, largely um, because at IPPR North, we're very cognizant of the, the, you know, lots of think tanks putting recommendations together, telling local authorities that they need to do things without considering the capacity that is required to do that. And, and you know, I think the guidance that um, Josh talked about has recently been published by uh, MHCLG and DWP jointly does talk about what local authorities are doing. And, it, you know, I think it does increase or, or, or recommend their role in terms of uh, that local regulation of support in um, and points to it as best practice. But I do think that the, the capacity is, is fallen so strongly that local authorities often just don't have the ability to play that role. And that saying that, well, they do it through commissioning isn't perhaps a, a, a sufficient because often that just means meeting the particular financial or governance arrangements outlined in, 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 the, in, in, in the commissioning process rather than actually saying we expect that you know people can thrive in these properties and that the housing is of, of uh, such a good standard that they're not cold it's not like mold on the walls all of those little things that like we see across the housing sector that don't get listed in uh, contracts i think that's that's part of the problem that we see is there just isn't that capacity to do the flexible uh, regulation that is required um local authorities can play that role but they would need funding and capacity to do it Great, great. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, and finally, um, Ben, um, we've heard a huge amount um, today um, about the, the challenge that transitional supported housing um, faces. You know, from your point of view, kind of what are your reflections, and, and particularly from the point of view of as Sask as, uh, as one of as one of the um, potential sort of funders and supporters of, of this agenda? It's been a it's been a great conversation, and you know, really really useful to hear everybody's comments. I think just to reflect back on private capital in the sector, um, I mean, look, the reality is there's a lot, there's a lot of private capital in the space, um, as Mona mentioned, um, and there's more looking to come in, and 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 some of that private capital creates good outcomes for people, uh, but some of it creates less good outcomes and even bad outcomes at times. Um, uh, one thing that, from our perspective, is definitely an issue is the lack of choice, or maybe even the balance of power between the providers of that capital and, uh, and the organisations that need it. Um, and it often leads or can lead to uh, solutions that don't match either the client base or, or the work that um, delivery organisations are doing with them. Um, I mean, specifically, you know, social investment and SAS specifically has, has looked for solutions where, um, which are tailored to uh, both individuals, but importantly bolsters the financial strength of the social sector organisations that are delivering services and keeps high quality uh, housing in the sector for the long term. And I think that's the difference of the uh, social investment approach that it is, it is it's, although it is about returns for investors and it is about, um, uh, you know, it, it is about attracting capital, it's also balanced with um, creating an environment for charities that, who can, you know, who can operate safely with this housing and improve services in the long run. Um, you know, that's where SAS comes from. That's where social sustainable housing has come from. Um, and ultimately it is our goal and we've already started on that path, but I think there's a lot more to do to um, make it clear to the providers of commercial capital that structures like ours are, are the ones to, uh, to back going forward. Great, Thank, thanks Ben. Um, unfortunately, um, we're out of time. Um, we could, uh, as Imogen say, talk, said, you know, talk about this for the next five hours, but, we won't, but I doubt all of us have got five hours to, to, to spare on this um, at the minute. But lots of just, you know, looking at, again, lots of interesting other comments in, in the chat box that we didn't get to, you know, points about um, rent farming, which is a new term for me that, that Mark raised. Um, and also um, the point about that Caroline's making on there about community land trusts and the potential that they could play. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so lots of, of great stuff in there and, and I want to thank all of you for taking part um, this morning and for um, contributing so generously to, to the discussion. Um, I've certainly found it really interesting and it is always really interesting as, as you know, as a think tank and to, to sort of put something out there and then and hear it and hear it reflected back. Um, and I think for, from our point of view, IPPR and IPPR North, this is something that, that we, are, we are keen to, um, to look at. Um, and, and to try and influence it and to, and to try to see um, action and, and, and change, if you like, as well. Um, we realise that's not a, a short-term ambition, but 
um, I think the, the challenge of COVID-19 and, and the pressure that that's going to put on communities right across the country um, means that there's a, an even greater urgency to act if we're to, to kind of um, to, to sort of stop building up trouble for us further down the line. So um, I I'm, go I'm going to draw the conversation to a close there. I, I want to also invite you um, to thank our speakers. Um, a really interesting set of uh, uh, discussions from, from them and, and observations. Um, and uh, I also um, want to thank, thank Ben and, and Marcus for their contributions as well. Um, and I, and um, yeah, obviously clapping is a little bit more difficult, but, but thanks for those, uh, thanks for those uh, virtual claps um, online. Um, if you are interested in following up with us on anything that, that's been mentioned today or, or any of the research or indeed any of our any of our work, please do get in touch um, and uh, our, our details are available um, on our website and um, for both Marcus and I. Um, we welcome uh, approaches from anybody to, to, to look at our work and to, to talk further with us, um, because certainly when we write a report, it really is for us the, the beginning of the process rather than the end. So it'd be, it'd be really good to, to follow up some of the conversations with you. Um, so it remains for me just to, to thank you all again, to thank our speakers, and uh, I hope that you all have uh, a very safe and enjoyable rest of the day. Thank you.